So welcome everybody uh, to our uh, July uh, um, member lunch our, and our uh, uh, webinar. Um, this is uh, Steve Spence, uh, the incoming president of uh, CEOST. Uh, thank you all for uh, for attending today. Uh, today we're we're it's gonna be a little bit of a different presentation than what we typically do. First of all, we usually don't uh, have a July uh, meeting. We usually go dark for most of the um, summer, but we wanted to have. Uh, an opportunity for all of our uh, committee chairs to present on what they're doing and then we're going to go into our uh, first ever virtual uh, award ceremony for our, uh, excellence in structural engineering and, um, awards so uh, i first like to uh, do a few chapter announcements and then uh, we'll go over uh, the, the changes to the board and then we'll get into the committee reports uh, so uh, First thing, we have a continuing education uh, um, uh, webinar um, that's planned for August 20th at noon, and it'll be on uh, uh, Teams. Uh, the Development Services Department from the City of San Diego is going to be going over their uh, new online permitting program. Um, that'll be very informative. I think everybody's excited to move to a, a more electronic version of uh, submitting, and hopefully, it'll really streamline things. Uh, so they'll be presenting that on August 20th at noon. Uh, look for uh, an email blast uh, from uh, Heather regarding uh, regarding that. Um, our next planned uh, webinar um, is on September 15th. That'll be noon. Um, and Mike Romanowski from Woodworks will be uh, doing a presentation um, called Exploring Tall Wood, the new code provisions for tall timber structures that will be implemented in the interim code uh, cycle starting uh, this upcoming January 1st. Um, I guess before I go into any other announcements, at least for the foreseeable future, um, at least through the fall and probably through the winter, we will be hosting our all of our monthly meetings in, um, in webinar format uh, electronically. Um, so uh, just plan on that. All, all our presentations will be at noon um, on the on the days we have selected. Uh, we have not figured out our October meeting yet, um, but we do have our November uh, meeting planned. Uh, we're honored to have uh, this year's TR Higgins lecture from AISC, uh, Bo Dowswell, who will be presenting on his uh, lecture, uh, Gusset Plates, the Evolution of Simplified Design Modules. Um, so that'll be November 17th at noon in an electronic format. Um, just a couple other announcements. Um, you may have seen in your invoice or your your inbox that our uh, membership invoicing has started. Um, we'd like to um, maintain and add as much as many members we have uh, as we could possibly have in there. So um, we encourage you all to uh, renew uh, your membership. Uh, your membership is very important to us, and that's how we are able to do the things that we're able to do. Um, we do also have uh, sponsorships available online for either uh, uh, general sponsorships or, um, you know, uh, lunch meeting sponsorships. Uh, so please, uh, um, if you're interested, please contact some, uh, one of us on the board. Um, and uh, we would like to have you uh, come on as a sponsor. Um, so I, I would. With that, I'd like to hand uh, the reins to uh, Casey, uh, our past president, to uh, kind of recognize the people that he has been on the board with and uh, recognize the, the new members of the board. So Casey, take it away. Thank you, Steve. Much appreciated. So as Steve was saying, my name is Casey Whitsett. I'm our outgoing president. Um, Steve, why don't you go ahead and advance the slide there and, and excited to recognize a few people. Um, so. Uh, we have a few individuals who have wrapped up their time on the board and who are going to be, be exiting the board. Uh, Chad Kloss is going to be exiting the, the board. He spent two years as treasurer and has done an outstanding job um, in that role uh, during his time. Really want to thank him for his diligence and, and effort. One of the, the thoughts that came to our mind as, as we were thanking him in our board meeting was that he's just been an amazing steward of our organization. Um, all the way from taking care of our, our monthly finances to but really trying to think big about how to set up our organization for financial success in the future. Um, and especially during this time where we, we obviously have a lot of uncertainty associated with what the economy is going to be doing. Um, Chad just did, a, did an outstanding job in, in trying to forecast 
what our our future budget's going to be looking like. So uh, much appreciated to to Chad. Um, Aaron Pebley has also finished his um, his duration as a director. Um, Aaron, thank you so much for for your time. Um, for those of you who don't know, Aaron as a director was overseeing a, a couple of very active committees, um, SC3 um, and um, and um, I'm going to totally blank on on Aaron's the other awards committees. Committee. What's awards. that? Yeah, awards committee. That's the other big one. What are we doing today? Uh, thank you, Steve, for that assist. Um, so thank you, Aaron. Uh, Stephen Crook is exiting as our past president and also finishing his tenure on the state board. Um, Stephen, thank you so much for, for your assistance. Uh, many people may not know, but Stephen actually stepped into the leadership track for CIOST under kind of unique circumstances. Um, our vice president at the time had some health issues and, and Stephen basically jumped from being a director and into stepping into a three-year commitment for the, the leadership track and has, has really um, done the, the association a huge benefit in terms of, of, of serving in that role. Um, and last but not least, I wanted to mention Jose Restrepo, um, who many of us have interacted with in his, uh, in his tenure at UCSD as one of the leading concrete researchers there. And um, as we were, we were students, it was really a really a, a special um, opportunity to get to serve with Jose on the board. Um, one of the things that we were really excited about was continuing to, to to build that relationship between UCSD and academia and the Structural Engineers Association, and his willingness to uh, to volunteer his already limited time to our association went went really far in doing that. Um, so each of these individuals is going to be missed, and, and we definitely applaud them as they wrap up their, their current terms of service. Uh, continuing on our board, uh, Aaron Taylor and John Deck are, are both in the middle of their director terms. The, the director term is a two-year term, so they finished one year and have one more year to go. Steve, if you can advance the slide there. New board members coming on. Uh, we have two new directors joining the board, Garrett Mifsud with KPFF and Matt Wexler with MHP are going to both be starting their terms uh, for their, their two-year directorship. And let's go one more forward. Joining us in the treasurer um, role to replace Chad is Harsha Prasad with HTK. Uh, Harsha, we're, we're very much looking forward to working with you. Um, and I know that there's a big handoff going on right now between you and Chad for, for all those ins and outs. Our vice president or president-elect is Bo Jacquis, who's coming on. He's principal and founder of TKJ Structural Engineers. Uh, Bo, we're very excited to have you um, step into the VP role. And I know that everybody's going to get to see your, your face as you start to, to handle some of the, the programming and whatnot uh, through next year. So welcome to the board and welcome to uh, to kind of the leadership track. I know that that Steve and I and the rest of the board are very excited to to, to have you as part of the team. Stepping into his role as as president is is Mr. Steve Spence, um, as we've already announced. Uh, Steve, I'm really excited to be able to hand off the, the reins of the, the president role to you and to continue to, to support you and Bo as we go forward. Um, so I will let defer to you to, to talk probably next year about what some of your goals are in, in terms of of, uh, of your, your presidency for, for CIOS, but I know that you're passionate about keeping up a lot of the momentum that has been building over the, the past years and committee activity. So um, very, very excited to, to see you step into the role. Excited to help. And then I'll be continuing on as our past president, um, both Steve uh, Spence and I will essentially be our state representatives to the CIOC board for the next year. Um, and I think that's it for the, the director updates. All right, with that, um, thank you, Casey, for uh, those uh, warm words for the departing uh, uh, board members and the introductions to the, the incoming ones. Um, with that, we'll, let's get to our committee reports. So first up, is Heather Kaya regarding the golf tournament. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We're very excited to announce our golf tournament. We were pretty sad and disappointed that we couldn't have our golf tournament this year, but we are planning for our 2021 golf event. Um, so if anyone is interested in joining a fun committee and you love golf, uh, send me an email at seaosd at cox.net and definitely save the date. Our a new date is going to be Monday, May 3rd, 2021. We have our fingers crossed that we can definitely do this next year. Um, so definitely save the date. We'll probably start making more announcements and more information coming uh, January 2021. So thank you very much. Next is our SE3 committee. So if, uh, for those, uh, if you could just unmute yourself and uh, and direct me on how you want to uh, move around your slides. Uh, um, we'll, we'll keep this moving along. Yeah, I'll talk about the first slide. Hi everyone, I'm John Murphy. I'm the co-chair of the SC3 committee alongside Lovelyn Benitez. Uh, I wanted to give a little bit of background on SC3. We have in 2016, Seonk did a survey, a national survey of, of structural engineers and they surveyed employee engagement and also uh, pay equity for structural engineers, and they found uh, some insights into the reasons that people leave structural engineering and also the importance of mentorship and also found a nuanced gender pay gap. So shortly after the survey, the National SE3 committee was created um, and we created our local SE3 committee in late 2018. Uh, so SE3 stands for the Structural Engineering Engagement and Equity Committee, and our main goals are to improve employee engagement and career satisfaction for structural engineers, and then also to raise awareness and promote dialogue around equity, diversity, and inclusion. And what mm -hmm. the ways that we do that are creating surveys, providing resources, and holding events to support these goals. Um, and with that, you can go to the next slide. And then um, I'm Luvalin Benitez. I'm the other co-chair with John. Thanks for that intro. So some of the accomplishments we've made as a committee is um, we've done a work-life balance survey and provided those summary responses to the CIOS membership. Um, we've surveyed CIOS on engagement and interview prep challenges. Um, we did have our first event back in, um, I believe, last fall. Um, so it's been a while. Um, anyway, and so it was about how to prepare for an interview, negotiate salary, and ask for a raise. And we had a pretty good turnout with over 20 people attending. Um, and we also provided the same summary of tips to our attendees at student night uh, back in February. Um, our future goals are um, to to improve diversity and inclusion. Um, I believe a whole, uh, we just sent out a survey to the membership of, uh, about about an hour ago. So um, if you could, it would be great if you could respond to the survey. Um, we'd like to get some of your feedback of what you think you can do to help us out with in improving that in our industry. Um, and we plan to host uh, at least one event to promote diversity and inclusion and also to increase outreach to student chapters, especially at UCSD and San Diego State. So um, if you are interested in um, being a part of this committee, please feel free to give, to contact me. Um, my email address is luvalin.benitez at kaufman.com. Thank you. All right, next up is continuing education. So uh, Jen. Hey, yeah, this is Jen Shuffalo, um, committee chair of the Continuing Education Committee. Um, our committee mission statement is to provide seminars and or short technical programs of interest to the CIOS membership. These seminars, or I guess more recently all webinars um, and programs shall provide an avenue for our membership to receive the most current information and tools um, to help with structural analysis, design and detailing, um, and mainly focusing on the utilization of the latest technologies and design standards. 
Um, so some of our committee duties include attending one board meeting per year for committee updates. Um, our goal is to hold quarterly continuing education webinars on topics related to structural engineering. Um, and then we also act as a liaison with the state level webinars and seminars committee. Um, and that's just to advertise and keep the local membership informed on continuing education items kind of statewide. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Steve. Um, so our committee consists of five people. It's myself. Um, Ryan, Sam, Alish, and Paul. Um, in 2019 to 2020, we held two events, um, which were the Wind Design Manual Seminar as well as the AISC 358 webinar. Um, we do have some potential upcoming events. Uh, the recent one, or I guess the most current update, uh, upcoming one, excuse me, um, that was mentioned earlier is on the department, the developmental services department, new online permitting webinar. Um, so hopefully everyone can attend that one. Um, but if you have any ideas for future events or if you're interested in joining our committee, just let me know. Email address is up on the screen. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Uh, now uh, here's life of the awards committee. Hello. So uh, overall, the awards committee, our mission for, for this committee is to recognize and celebrate the achievements that we have in our field uh, in structural engineering. You guys probably have noticed there has been a shift in our uh, in the awards program this, uh, this year. We've tried to update and revamp the overall um, awards program by generating new, new new way that we reach out to you guys and updating announcements and emails. We introduced new local categories within our uh, month, uh, member organization that are different from the state level organ uh, uh, categories. Um, we are redefining the awards dinner concept and expectations. Uh, we were hoping that we would uh, do something this year, but unfortunately with COVID, it limited what we can do, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that are gonna be different for next year, hopefully. So keep an eye out for that. Um, we try to we I think we lost Hello. you. Oh. We're losing your audio. It's okay. Laith, I think we'll we'll everybody here can read the read the screen, so I think we'll move on. We'll see. Hopefully, we can figure out your audio because we definitely need your audio for the back half of this presentation. All right. Thank you. Hello, all. It's Mike West, with Kaufman Engineers. Uh, I'm a co-chair of the uh, San Diego Board of Appeals. Um, basically, our committee goal is to assist and advise the building official and to provide a voice for CIOST and the City of San Diego's adoption and enforcement. Um, it's a what is the board? It's it's a it's created by the city council. It's a 10 member panel that's basically, as, as mentioned, tasked with assisting and advising the city building official. Uh, members consist of an architect, a fire protection, mechanical, electrical, a disabled advocate, a public member and two civil engineers, one of whom is a, a authorized use the title structural engineer. Um, the last two spots, they're recommended by CIOST and we, sh we share the committee chair and, and currently the, the, the two chairs are, are myself and Shane Noel. Um, I probably won't go through all of these committee duty duties, but we, you know, we attend the Board of Appeals meetings uh, whenever they occur. I think I've been to one in 15 years. Um, advise the building official and suitability of any material design construction methods and recommend reasonable interpretations of the code. Thank you, Mike. And that's pretty much it. Hey, uh, student liaison committee. Hi, everyone. My name is Angeline. I served as this year's committee chair for the student liaison committee. So our committee is a great committee to be involved in. We pretty much hold the best position to facilitate interaction between our local students from UCSD and SDSU um, and our experienced professionals in the industry. So we did quite a lot. We try to maintain CEO's presence at both school student organizations and um, in order to encourage membership with CEO's and student participation in our monthly meetings and networking events. 
A few events and programs we host throughout the year are the student site tours of job sites, like this year we did the UCSD Mesa housing. Um, and we, and in order to give students, you know, a peek at a day in the life of a structural engineer, we also do. We also host the student mentorship program um, in collaboration with the YMF committee, which this year went successfully. Um, so we hope to grow that in the coming years. We have the job shadow program, and last but not least, we help put together the annual student night where we award scholarships. So, and this year we awarded not just three but four scholarships to very deserving students. Um, as you can see, there are many ways to get involved. Our strength definitely comes from our committee members and volunteers and those who provide us um, with guidance. So I want to give a special shout out and thank you to our committee members, Ryan, Jose, and Henrik, and um, to the YMF committee, especially Song, Daniel, and Christine. Um, and lastly, to our director, John Deck, for your guidance throughout the year. So if you're interested in volunteering or joining a committee, just let me know. Feel free to email me. There were definitely a lot of things we weren't able to do this year due to the special circumstances we're in, but I'm confident that we'll be better equipped for this upcoming year. Thank you. The convention committee. Can you hear me, Steve? Yep. Hello, this is uh, Michael Braun uh, with Engelp Engineers. I'm uh, one of the co-chairs for the uh, 2021 SEAC convention with Steve Kerr. Uh, Steve Kerr and Wendy Sullivan have uh, led this committee for at least three or four, probably more uh, conventions. And so I've, I've gotten involved uh, to help them assist it. Uh, this year's convention uh, that was supposed to be in uh, Maui, Hawaii has been uh, moved to a virtual as, as you should all probably know by now. So that will be occurring in October. And our hope is that by next September, we have some uh, back to uh, normalcy and are able to have our convention at the uh, Omni Resort in La Costa up in Carlsbad. So that's where we are currently booked right now and the convention committee has met uh, a number of times in getting uh, plans for the all the different events. Uh, this is our convention committee uh, list. We, we are fairly uh, full on all the leadership positions. We do have uh, one uh, position with the uh, AV house that is still open if someone's interested in that. but. Uh, even if you're interested in uh, helping, you know, the technical committee needs a group of SEs to help pick the um, abstracts that go into the technical program. There's a lot of day of um, um, participation that we need. So even if you just want to help uh, participate and volunteer on the, uh, during the actual convention, please reach out to Heather or Steve or myself uh, to get you involved. Hey, Mike, quick question. I don't see an awards chair on here. Does uh, do we? Do you guys need an awards chair for the awards program, or is that ha ha uh, handled in, uh, independently? It's handled by the state separately. So our, you know, because our committee here is, even though it's SEOC, it's all SEOST. Mm -hmm. The um, the state um, does have an award chair, and they do like it to be from the region mm -hmm. during each of the ones. But it is uh, handled kind of separately of our committee. Okay. All right, the wind committee. We have somebody uh, on the wind committee uh, able to speak. Should be Steve. Steve, can you unmute yourself? All right, you know, I can talk a little bit to it, or we can read. Um, so we have a there. There's a wind committee. They uh, um, they mainly work. Uh, as part of the state committee rather than having a um oh a, oh there you are steve hey you steve go. sorry about that um having to borrow equipment from my kids um <laughs> so i do want to say thanks to mike for stepping up with the the seahawk um convention committee um thank you mike and everyone who's volunteered it's a very um big effort for us um but talking about the wind committee um, here locally, we don't have a wind committee. If anyone's interested in volunteering, we can look at forming one, but um, it's mostly a state level committee, um, which you could see is comprised of one member being me from San Diego, along with um, several other members from the rest of the, um, the state. Um, one of the big activities we've done, and Jen's been promoting it, thankfully, um, is our wind design manual. Um, if you want, you could get a copy of that. Um, and so that's one of the big activities we've done over the past couple of years. 
Um, one of the things our members do is uh, they're involved with ASCE 7 um, Standards Committee looking at the wind provisions and um, several members uh, are involved in going to those hearings and being involved. Um, one of the things we just started this year is a special wind region study. Um, we're looking to update the wind regions for uh, California, trying to get a wind study done through CPP to um, look at our maps to see if we need more special wind region areas or how we can give our, our membership what those uh, wind speeds should be in those areas. So that's what we're doing. Um, we do have one subcommittee that's bigger and more involved than um, our wind committee is the photovoltaic subcommittee. And um, for those of you that don't know, um, there's been several papers issued. The most recent is PV3, uh, which came out last year, and that's on gravity design for rooftop solar arrays. So all of those papers are available to the membership um, free through the SEAC bookstore. So um, go ahead and get a copy of those if you don't already have them. And anyone that wants to get involved, please let me know. Thanks, Steve. Now we have uh, Victor with the Seismology Committee. Hello, everyone. Um, well, um, I am the chairman of the Seismology Committee, and the purpose and the mission of our uh, committee is to promote the excellence and the best practices of seismic uh, structural design through the collaborative effort of its members and all our affiliate organizations. Uh, this committee works together with uh, uh, four other organizations at the state level and, and headquarters to um, look at the seismic issues that affect us structural engineers. So our uh, activities during the last year were pretty much uh, devoted at the beginning of the year uh, to finalize the blue book that finally was uh, completed. And of course, this was a, a milestone uh, publication because it was the 60th anniversary of this uh, uh, publication. We started back in uh, 2016 and it was finally printed and became available uh, last year during the, the convention at um, Olympic Valley. After the convention, uh, we have been working together with the other uh, engineers in um, mostly um, going through uh, member organization ballots. This is the way that we participate in, in uh, modifying or affecting uh, the building codes because uh, all these decisions are made as a consensus and uh, SEAC is a very important uh, partner in, in um, modifying uh, or influencing the, the code. So we have been working on uh, uh, several and um, the, the one we worked on, on um, uh, last year were the member decision ballot number two in, in July, uh, ballot number three on November, uh, ballot number four on February of this year, and the last one was the ballot number five on, on April of, uh, of this year. One other um, um, activity that we were planning, and this was unfortunately put on hold because of the, the crisis, was to uh, work together with the um, uh, Continuing Education Committee. I think that Jennifer uh, showing a slide that we're about to, or we were planning to have some presentations uh, based on the, the articles of the Blue Book that uh, we thought would be of interest to, to young engineers. Uh, so that idea was put on hold because of the crisis, but maybe in the future we're still gonna be able to, to uh, uh, present some of those uh, articles. Uh, of course, because of the crisis, we've been doing all uh, all the meetings uh, remotely. Uh, and um, why you want to be involved with this committee, of course, is to find out what is the future directions of the building codes. We want to be able to share our expertise, design experience with other colleagues. 
And of course, it's a great opportunity to, to learn from experts in the field, network, meet other engineers, and of course, to participate in the, the committees of the uh, Structural Engineers Association. Uh, there's uh, my contact information. One other announcement I want to make, of course, is that um, we are going to need a new delegate for this uh, committee. And uh, it has to be a member of SEAC, preferably, which is a registered structure engineer. So if you are interested, please email me or contact me. And there's always uh, lots of, of good work that can be done for the seismology committee. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. All right, now onto the Younger Member Forum uh, Committee. And I would say we're, we're, we're running a little bit behind, so if people could be a little bit uh, more brief with their uh, um, with their committee announcements, that way we can get to the, uh, have plenty of time for the award ceremony, that'd be great. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, I'll try to be quick. Uh, hi, everyone, I'm Song. Uh, I'm co-chairing the Younger Member Forum Committee along with uh, Christine, Christine Drummy. Um, YMF, uh, our goal is to uh, promote pr professional growth and sort of uh, facilitate social involvement uh, uh, and, and interaction for our younger members. Um, and some, some of the events that we hold uh, include happy hours, uh, technical presentations, uh, and uh, we also help um, uh, organize some of the CIOST events, uh, such as the student night, uh, and we also hold um, annual, uh, we hold an annual epic mixer, um, and we'll get into that in the, in the later slides. But, um, sorry, can you go back to the previous? Uh, so yeah, some of the happy hours we, we held at the end of last year um, included uh, being a first responder uh, with Mike West and a geotechnical presentation with Taylor Latimer. If Christine can talk about the mentorship program. Our mentor program pairs local college students with professional engineers to discuss the ins and outs of work life, whether that be about different career paths they can take within the field, how to get an internship, or what lessons we've learned along the way. Uh, this year, mentors were able to meet one on one with their mentees or in group settings at um, bonfires are out to get coffee. Unfortunately, the last couple of months of the program were filled with video chat meetings only, um, but the mentoring continued regardless. We can't wait to have a new group of mentors and mentees this fall. And uh, student night, um, we helped organize uh, the Q&A panel, uh, uh, which was pretty insightful uh, with uh, various range of uh, speakers. Um, and thank you, uh, shout out to Angeline, who uh, who came up with the idea for the uh, Instagram printout for taking photos. <laughs> uh, next slide. Our biggest event this year was the fourth annual Epic Mixer at Ballast Point. Uh, the Epic Mixer is for emerging professionals in the community and is hosted by AIA, ASHRAE, and CIOST. We had quite a turnout this year and we all enjoyed drinks, appetizers, and networking opportunities. The proceeds went to the Women's Construction Coalition and the Julia Morgan Society Scholarship. As we are unsure of whether we will be able to have in-person networking events such as this one in the upcoming year, we guarantee a variety of opportunities for our young members to participate in. If you wish to be included in the YMF email list or wish to participate in the mentor program this next year, please reach out to me or Song. Thank you both. Now the Sustainable Design Committee. Hey folks, Jim Conley with uh, Co uh, Kaufman Engineers. I'm chair of the uh, Sustainable Design Committee along with Mike Romanowski. Ma Romanowski is also the co-chair of our committee. Um, our uh, um, kind of mantra, if you will, is to advance the, the cause of sustainable design by making sustainability considerations an integral part of structural engineers thinking and by providing tools to facilitate structural engineers actions in advancing sustainable design. Um, you know, uh, when when the president asked for kind of hey, give me an update on your uh, 
your, your goals for the year, it kind of talks about what, what's the guiding star. And for ours, it's more planet, Mother Earth. So what can we be doing, all, all of those that are passionate about sustainable design to help kind of improve the efforts that we put forward and what can we do as a structural engineer? Uh, to, to that end, we had a, a lot of successes from the past year. Um, we continued on with our life cycle assessment concrete study um, where we're learning about the impacts of, of concrete, a uh, paper that was put forth uh, at the last year's SEAC convention. Uh, we do member-wide presentations uh, on sustainable topics. Um, we'll talk about some of those in the coming slide here. And one of the upcoming things that we're aiming for is to create a sustainable building map for San Diego. That's something that we just kind of got kicked off um, by inspiration from our existing buildings committee. Uh, our meetings happen monthly on the first Friday. Uh, they're they're online, so you're welcome to to join us. Uh, we have about eight active members, um, twelve that come consistently, um, and with the two co-chairs, that, that's a great group. Uh, where I want to invite anyone to come to our meetings, even if you just have any interested. Um, every part of our meeting has kind of a sustainable design 101 aspect of it, uh, where we send out an article and have someone read it. Uh, or have folks read it and kind of report back. So even if you aren't deeply in involved or knowledgeable about the subject, you're always welcome to, to join us. Um, on the next slide uh, are some of the things we presented about back in 2019, a kind of sustainable design 101. Uh, we did a presentation in paper for the concrete mix designs. And then Mike Romanowski earlier in the year presented on mass timber structural design engineering modern timbered structures um so so that had a really great i think that was one of our first online presentations um and we had quite a showing for it so a lot of interest in that area so uh, please reach out to mike and myself if you're interested all right on to, thank you uh thank you jim uh on to the existing buildings committee all righty hey everybody um i'm peter i'm the current chair for the existing buildings committee um over the last year, we really focused on uh, assisting the EERI Rose Canyon scenario uh, and then pulling together a framework and then uh, a significant portion really of the vulnerable building survey in San Diego. Um, that kind of included a detailed look at the downtown area and inventorying URM, non-ductile concrete, uh, steel moment frame, pre-Northridge pre steel moment frames, and then tilt up rigid wall flexible diaphragm buildings. Um, if you haven't checked out the scenario, which was put out by EERI, I really highly recommend that you take a look at it. It was a, I think T Tony can correct me if I'm wrong here, but around a five year long project going through. So uh, really a great accomplishment to, to have that out. Uh, you can go to the next slide there. So um, really over this last year, we've uh, spent a significant portion of our time really on that survey and scenario there. Um, and we're hoping this year to expand the committee and take on several projects at both the state and local uh, levels. Uh, you can see some of those that we're hoping for on the screen there. Um, for 2020, San Diego has taken the role of state chair. And so therefore I'm definitely looking for someone interested in stepping into a co or vice chair role um, for the local committee so that we can really keep things moving down here. Um, so if you do have any interest in existing buildings, please reach out to me, pmaloney at dagenkolb.com. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you on board. Thank you, Peter. Now it's on to me and the code committee. Um, so our, our goals on the code committee is, is basically be a resource for um, the community at large and our membership uh, with regards to um, the building code. Um, the code committee, or at least as it's known as uh, um, at the state, the general engineering technical committee, it's mainly a, it's mainly focused towards uh, CEOC work rather than having a, we don't really have a local committee, um, although I'd be happy to get uh, some additional involvement. Um, but we basically, we're, we're wanting to work with uh, CEOC and NCSEA and um, hopefully uh, more of the model codes, the ASCEs, the ACIs to help uh, develop and streamline the code and you know edit um, so that's what we've been doing and you know over the last year we because we're in the middle of a um or like in between code cycles we really haven't done a whole lot 
So I, I, I've started thinking about what I would like the code community to kind of turn into. And what I'd like it to be is a bit of a, a, a sounding board or a forum where you know practicing consulting engineers can uh, discuss uh, code interpretations with uh, um, the people having uh, you know governing jurisdiction, our, our cities and our you know and uh, Skill, um, and that way we can we can get some consistency with the interpretation of the code and have a, a dialogue so that we all can um, work together to to Im improve our built environment. So if you have any um, questions or are interested in participating, um, please email me at the uh, at the email that you see there, steve.spence at kpff.com. Thank you. So now on to the business forum committee. Do we, uh, I don't know if Scott Larson's on. Uh, I can go through these slides. Um, so uh, the business forum is, is a resource for uh, a lot of our small businesses to uh, to pass around information um, regarding how to do um, do better within their uh, their business as a as a as a, um, as a practitioner. So um, they talk about contracts and setting fees and 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 um, and how to better market themselves and uh, basically sharing resources that a lot of the, the you know the smaller firms don't necessarily have at least when compared to a bigger firm. Um, so this is, uh, there, there, ideally there'd be, you know, smaller firm, firm owners, uh, involved, although I think uh, they would probably take participations from some of the larger firms as well. That way we can spread some of the, uh, knowledge down and they want to be able to host some, uh, some, some seminars, webinars or conferences, uh, um, to talk about the issues that uh, are involved with the, uh, you know, running a structural engineering business. All right, we're going to move on to the Disaster Emergency Services uh, Committee. Is uh, is Ian on? Um, I don't believe he's on. So, um, the Disaster Emergency Service Committee. Um, no, that's the earthquake scenario. <clears throat> is um, I believe that's the uh, committee involved with uh, uh, training people to be able to respond to uh, um, emergencies, um, you know, be able to facilitate ATC training so that we can go out and, you know, red tag buildings, for whether it's an earthquake or a wind or a flood event. Um, and I don't have any notes in front of me regarding whether or not they have any uh, seminars planned, but I, I know that they typically do have at least one or two um, training uh, seminars planned over the course of the year so that people can get trained up um, uh, with regards to uh, um, ATC or Cal OES uh, certification. Um, so Ian Mellor is our uh, uh, is our chair for that and uh, you could find his email on the, the website if you if you're uh, wanting to uh, get trained up or wanting to help him out. Um, now it's uh, Tony Court's block of uh, um, uh, subjects, and Tony, I'm going to uh, warn you. I did edit out a couple of your uh, your slides that you sent because uh, um, you had a you had a lot of information on there. Um, so um, if you'd like to um, first uh, talk a little bit about the earthquake scenario, that'd be great. Yeah, give me a brief. What do you have in here? You kept this one for scenario and then one for the next what do you have? um I, I i've got i've got two slides for for each where mainly what i cut out was on the atc was all the the kind of the history behind atc that was that was basically what i what i edited out uh, the scenario uh hopefully you're all aware of we completed this five-year study where siac or sea osd played a, a significant role with eeri to develop the earthquake scenario um, and we published that in March. Um, there is, as Peter mentioned, there's a lot of interesting info there. Uh, and do you have the next slide? Um, I, I cut out the one that had the heat map on it. Or like the, the well, um, why don't we sit back on the first one then? Sure. Uh, the question of where, where we go from here, 
the initial effort is completed, but there's plenty of opportunity for SEA OSD to uh, participate and to, to maintain activity in this area going forward. And I would suggest a first step is to add a scenario link or page to our website, tie over to SEA OSD. The, the scenario is intended to be a long-term implement, implementation uh, uh, effort and we can do steps towards getting that implementation done. A second important part is what Peter mentioned, developing the inventory of vulnerable buildings. Um, a, a third uh, effort is something we could do, draft uh, retrofit ordinances. We There's plenty to draw from, from San Francisco and LA in particular. We could establish more, a better relationship with city council and with uh, building officials and have what I call shovel ready ordinances that we could present to them uh, at, after the next earthquake, if not sooner, to you know, prepare ourselves in the community to advance the cause of retrofitting of these older buildings. Uh, and then finally, on EER collaboration, we should not drop the ball. Uh, somebody like Peter or, or uh, another designee might be a good person to follow through, maintain an ongoing relationship with EERI as we go through the next few years of implementing the uh, uh, scenario action items. Next slide. And that's our summary uh, image. Existing buildings I mentioned, uh, it's a key component that Peter has uh, mentioned already. Next. And the uh, um, objective of the scenario for those who, who have not seen the previous presentations is ultimately to make San Diego more resilient to earthquakes and other disasters. And this slide illustrates that uh, concept and that we're currently on the blue line where we have an aging system of buildings and infrastructure. We get uh, potentially some significant damage from an earthquake and have a long slow recovery time. The objective is to improve the infrastructure and improve the buildings so that we get less damage and have a shorter recovery period. Next. Uh, well, how you slipped through? Did you keep any of the other slides related to this topic? To uh, that was all that I. I think this was the last slide that I. I don't remember if I. I don't. I'd have to look back and see. Right. But um, uh, basically, we. Um, so ATC board. A lot of uh, uh, the membership sort of has lost track of what ATC has done, uh, and so these. Uh, it, it's worth reminding. Uh, what their history is. They were founded 60 some 50, 60 years ago, early 1970s, by SEAC to um, uh, promote research to practice to improve seismic engineering practice. And they put out a great number of key documents, including the ATC 20 that was referenced earlier related to post earthquakes evaluations, uh, the SAC documents for steel moment frames, the basic uh, guideline for performance-based engineering and for size evaluation. Uh, it, it, so, you know, it's an important group that still uh, contributes a great deal to depression and more we plug in. Uh, I am completing a second uh, term on the board of directors and we will need a replacement person about 18 months from now. The item two identifies what the duties are of that board member, and I would encourage interested candidates to contact the board or myself to see what ATC needs in terms of filling a slot on the board next year and uh, consider your interest in appointing somebody for the following three years. Next. Next. Well, that, that's about it <laughs> on ATC. I, I, uh, I, I cut out all the... Uh, um, this is another topic. Uh, mm -hmm. Post-disaster performance observation committee was uh, uh, very active in the first 10 years of the, of the century, but has been not so active since 2012. And uh, they, they made a, a good effort at outlining procedures for doing post-earthquake performance evaluation of buildings, focusing on all buildings surrounding strong motion instrumentation locations. And then they uh, 
sent uh, teams out to do these evaluations after the Easter earthquake in 2010 and the uh, L'Aquila earthquake in Italy in 2009 and the Christ Christchurch earthquake in New Zealand in 2011. Uh, there's been no activity in recent years, but I think the SEAC should consider resurrecting this committee and uh, you know getting ready for the next earthquake. So that's all I've got on these three topics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. And uh, last but not least, the uh, Communications and Public Relations Committee. So, Jackie. Hi there. Yes, my name is Jackie Lee. Um, as you can see here, I do a little bit of everything. Um, currently, I'm a committee of one. I'm hoping to grow that to at least a um, co-committee member. Um, and at some point here, maybe a bigger committee of many members, um, because there is a lot going on. We do a little bit of everything, everything from internal communication relating to every um, committee on, in CIOS, as well as reaching out to public other community members. Um, our goal is to broaden our membership and broaden our reach, whether it means current members, younger members, um, members that have left us, and maybe we can re reach them back in and engage them again, as well as connecting with community members from city planning city development because our structures do affect people around us and we want their input and um, we want them to know that we exist and the other part of it is really developing and managing our public image um, let's see Steve can you go to the next slide please sure so a part of managing our public image and connecting with people is the first step this year um, was really connecting with our members already. So we redeveloped and revamped our LinkedIn page. And our goal was to um, connect to all of our current members as much as we can. Uh, we started back in about September and October with zero members. And we've been able to connect up to 270 members as of today. Um, we've actually been doing all of our awards publications through LinkedIn because of COVID. We haven't been able to do any of our, our usual people uh, choice voting, and Lathe might be able to chime in on this one, but I think we had up to five or 600 votes this year, which was a huge increase from our usual just May members meeting. Yeah, we had over 600 participants this year. Yeah, so I think that's really exciting. One of the best things about this is um, doing it online. We're able to engage people throughout Southern California, people from all other industries. You know, you can see here um, at the top of our our slide, we, we're engaging construction members from the construction industry, design industry, um, real estate, architecture and planning, um, people from building materials and internet. And the stats from this is actually really cool. Uh, I know nothing about social media, but I'm getting to learn it. And I think it's fun to look at charts because, well, we like to interpret data. We are engineers. So our main goals from 2019 to 2020 were to really assist in membership and reach out to them. Can you go back one slide? Sure. And the second was to track our all the, all the events within CIOS and make sure that we're sending them out. Um, if they are events that might be interesting to other communities and other um, associations. We're trying to tag them to let them know. And then, of course, today's uh, awards community and publicizing them. Our goal is to make sure that uh, everyone who's submitted an, an entry gets a lot of recognition and everyone who wins and gets an award, every recipient gets a lot of recognition, not only through our own community, but through the entire San Diego community. So. Next slide, please. So if you like building relationships, know how to use a smartphone, um, enjoy happy hours or networking because we do need help reaching out to all of the other AEC um, associations. If you understand Instagram, because I really don't, please do, please do join our committee and grow this committee with us. Or if you're passionate about doing anything or being if you're already on one of these other committees for CIOS and would just like to help um, communicate and do public relations with us, that would be great. Please join us. 
Jackie, can you can you comment on what our um, status is on starting a TikTok page? Um, I'm going to say that a TikTok is currently um, a no go because of, from what I understand, the Reddit in the, the Reddit media says that there's a lot of Chinese malware, and I would like us to stay away from Chinese malware. Okay, gotcha. Well, it was a joke, anyways. But thank you. I for know. Taking it seriously. I wanted to take you very seriously as much as I could. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> Steve, did, did that did that bring us to the end of our committee reports? That that did. So I just want to take a quick second and and applaud each of the committees. Um, this year has been a, a year of incredible amount of activity and momentum. Uh, you guys on the committees are really the lifeblood of this organization. So thank you so much for all the time and the effort um, that 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 you put in. Um, you know, and, and the other word that comes to mind is really your adaptability. Um, it's been a story of two different years. Um, I was very impressed with things like our YMF group was was having record setting events at the beginning of the year. And, and really, you've had you had things tossed up in the air with, with COVID. So um, anyways, wanted to just just pause and say say thank you for both preparing today's presentations. I'm hoping that others get involved and Thank you so much for all of the uh, hours and, and dedication throughout this this past year. You, you guys are all pretty amazing group of people to be in this association with. So much appreciated. Thank you very much, Casey. And with that, uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Laith to start our awards um, ceremony. Um, thank you all. Um, um, I, I guess uh, thank you all to all our committee members. Um, while Lath is getting set up, um, a little bit of uh, um, housekeeping regarding this. Um, if you have any questions for um, any of the uh, awards winners, please uh, type them into the uh, um, the chat, and uh, I will uh, I will act as uh, the uh, MC regarding the uh, regarding the questions at the uh, at the end of their uh, their presentations. And also apologize for things are going a little bit long. I I hope everybody uh, hangs out and and. and uh, watches the entire uh, award ceremony. So without further ado, Leif. Well, hello again, guys. Hopefully I did not get a cut off again today, um, but uh, I would like to welcome you to the 2020 Excellence in Structural Engineering Award. Uh, my name is Leif and I am this year's awards chair. Overall, our, um, our committee aims, uh, or the awards program in general, aims to recognize and celebrate our industry's achievements for which firms are encouraged to submit projects under at least one of the following categories that are outlined here. The new construction, retrofit alteration, infrastructure, special use, historic preservation, study research, and guidelines. This year, as I've mentioned before, the has uh, we have a, we developed our own local categories for our uh, uh, for uh, San Diego. And these new kind of four categories were developed to highlight particular aspects of the structural engineering uh, which included the Community Award, the Materials Project of the Year, Innovative, innovative Structural Technologies, and Form Follows Function. Participation in, uh, participation in the CIOS Awards program sheds the light on our advances in the field, but it's also the first step towards qualifying for the state award. Only those, who are, uh, only those who are awarded for excellence and for people's choice will go to the CIOS um, to, be, to be judged for state awards. This year, we had five, in, uh, five individuals from our community who helped us judge the, uh, this year's entries. Um, and if you, uh, if you can please unmute yourself and help me uh, give them a round of applause to, to, uh, to our judges this year. Our first judge was Mr. Daniel McNesson, um, a, a, a retired FE. Our second judge from SGH, Mr. David Gonzalez. From Kaufman, Mr. Mike West. <laughs> and from JWA, Mr. Steve Kerr. And last but not least, my uh, my colleague from KPFS, Leanne Bell. Uh, 
um, each one of the uh, each one of uh, the judges presented uh, an interesting interesting point, and I was lucky to be part of that discussion. And on behalf of the uh, of CIOS and the structural engineering community, I would like to thank them again uh, for for putting the time and the effort. Now to the entries that we've received this year, uh, we, re uh, we received uh, entries under the, the highlighted categories, new construction, retrofit, infrastructure, and special use. And I quote, I quote Mr. David Gonzalez uh, with this, um, this year's project entries showcase the ingenuity of uh, San Diego's structural engineers, and we should celebrate the amazing technical expertise and imagination of our local peers. And hopefully we'll have much more to come in the next years. Under the first category, we received uh, new, new construction. We received three entries from DWE, Hoffman, and De Degenko. DWE's Conrad Pepe's Performing Arts Center was designed for La Jolla's Music Society. DWE worked closely with Epstein Jocelyn uh, architect, Joseph Wong design associate, um, and, um, and Nagata Acoustics and DCR Construction to deliver a cohesive product in a timely manner. The project consisted of 49,000 square foot uh, performing art center um, with, uh, with a double floor act, acting to, uh, as a pressurized plenum to allow uh, air to pass through silently and negative eight inch camber concrete slab to support, uh, support it on radial trusses. These were, uh, these were designed to accommodate acoustical demands for such, uh, for such a project. Our second entry was by Kaufman Engineers, uh, which was designed for BioLegend. Kaufman engineers worked along with Dolby Architects and Decar Construction and Hughes Marina Commercial Real Estate. This project consisted of a new 128,000 square foot uh, four-story lab and office building, renovation of an existing 47,000 square foot building, and new parking structure. Uh, unique, this, uh, this project uses innovative structural solutions such as steel tension rods on the south face of the atrium, to help control drift and technologies such as bolt, uh, bolted side plates. Um, I'm sorry. There we go. Okay. And bolted side plates uh, to help aid with the with the speed and the construction of the uh, lateral system. The final entry that was received under this category was uh, a sharp shoal of Vista Ocean uh, Ocean View Tower by Degging Co. Digging Co. worked closely with Smith Group and AVRP Skyport Architects and Pencil Folk Construction uh, Corporation to deliver a seven-story hospital tower supporting a structure in record time. This was managed despite the varying soil conditions leading to the use of wood soil mixing and large concrete pours. The second category for which we received entries is retrofit and alteration. We received two entries under, the, under this umbrella from Kaufman and Reed, Reed Middleton. Amper and Sand is owned by Casey Brown Company, who, who wanted to revamp the structure while still paying respect to its history. The project team consisted of Kaufman engineer, Walcott architect, and CW driver company contractors uh, to, ensure their vision, to ensure the vision came to life. Kaufman delivered an impressive redesign despite aesthetic constraints, limiting FRP applications and large windows, altering the wall behavior um, and requiring intensive, uh, intensive structural analysis. The second project uh, was submitted by Reed Middleton for the, for the, Reed, uh, for the Naval Air Weapons Station, uh, uh, Station China Lake. Due to the nature of this project, the judges decided to recategorize this entry under research uh, guide uh, under study research and guidelines. Reed Middleton provided support um, for immediate evaluation for structural safety stability, initial repair scope evaluation and cost estimate, as well as monitoring aftershock response for the building that's already failed to aid in future earthquake response. For the infrastructure of, uh, category, we received two entries from KPFF and Dagen Cope. Dagen Cope uh, submittal, the UCI, uh, UCI team consisted of uh, Dagen Cope working along with uh, Devaney Group Architect Kitchell, uh, TKA, TK1SC, Control Air Conditioning Corp, and Narrow Meadows to deliver a project with Oshpod and then Oshpod territories. Um, roof, roof HSS roof, uh, 
screens, mechanical structural elements that were beautifully displayed behind glass proves that even a utility can be architectural and, um, and aesthetically pleasing. On the other hand, KPFF worked alongside with Safi Robbins Architects and West Coast General Contractor to deliver an, an elegant pedestrian bridge for Sea Breeze properties at California State San Marcos. The building is, uh, is a 200 long concrete post tension uh, box girder designed with unsymmetric flares resulting in torsional issues. Uh, the teams also paid specific attention to the long-term uh, long deflection, continuously surveying data to calibrate the end result. And this brings us to the last uh, to the last entry that we got this year, uh, again from KPFF, Lyle and Grace Prescott Prayer Chapel, Chapel at Point Loma Nazarene University. Um, KPFF worked with Terry Johnson uh, to uh, and Terry Johnson's vision was brought brought to life through the collaboration efforts with KPFF and Brighter General Contractor. Structural building can be living over both sides of uh, over a small footprint, uh, utilizing shear walls in the long side and ordinary moment frames in the short direction. This project also had some other uh, technical uh, technical difficulties with from the uh, from the walls and detailing uh, and difficult detailing that came along. This brings us to, brings us to the results of uh, of our entries. And um, I would like to in, in, introduce uh, the award entries for the 2020 cycle. So if you can please put your hands together for the merit award. Um, so if you can please unmute yourself so we can just give them a round of uh, applause, starting with the merit awards for the new construction. So BWE was awarded uh, merit for new construction, and the, the judges also awarded it form policy function under the local categories. Uh, if you can please put your, your, put your hand together for the study and research guideline uh, winner uh, from Reed Middleton, the Naval Air Weapon Station, China, uh, China Lake Earthquake Response and Recovery. And for infrastructure, both uh, both uh, uh, both entries were awarded for merit uh, from KPFF and Dig and Cope. These uh, these two entries were vastly different, and the judges felt that it was uh, they both earned uh, recognition for the for the work that they've done. This brings us to the People's Choice Award. Uh, as Jackie has mentioned before, People's Choice Award was a unique situation this year where we could not vote in person. We utilized online uh, online voting and opened the door to other members from the community and not limiting it to Seahawks member. We received an overwhelming over 600 uh, over 600 votes uh, with Hoffman mm -hmm. Fire Legend uh, taking, taking over for the uh, People's Choice Award. So if you can please just put your hands together for... Uh, for the People's Award winner. And we'll be finishing the presentation uh, or my portion of the presentation with the Excellence Award. Um, under the under uh, the new construction awards, um, I'm, I'm quoting Mr. Dan in here, uh, the uh, this this entry uh, presented creative solutions to a difficult site constraint, and for this reason and many others, um, Dagen Cope was awarded for the excellence in new construction for their Sharp Chula Vista Ocean Ocean View Tower. Uh, for our next entry, this this uh, uh, I'm calling Leanne from for uh, for which for which she described this entry as a visionary transformation, an exciting use of analysis tool and multiple structural technology, and it's truly impressive. So under alteration and retrofit, we would like to recognize um, Amper and Sand by Kaufman for the Excellence in Structural Engineering Award, as well as the Innovative Structural, technical techno uh, structural technology Technologies for the local award.
And last but not least, for uh, for its unique for its unique design, or as uh, Dan had described it, a unique gym in a local university environment, we would like to recognize KPFF. Um, Lyle and Grace Prescott Prayer Chapel at Point Loma Nazarene University for excellence under the special use structure. I'm sorry if I rushed through this, I'm just trying to save you guys some time. But with that, I will turn to Mr. Michael Brunt from Digging Cove to, uh, to start his presentation for, for Sharp, uh, Chula Vista project um and we can go ahead as steve has mentioned the before if you guys have any questions just uh type that on the chat and steve will help communicate that one to 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 michael for um to get you guys a response sounds good thanks Leith. Uh, next slide please so yeah, I appreciate the, uh, the committee's uh, recognition of this project. This was definitely a special project to our San Diego office and, and our firm, and uh, definitely appreciate the, the recognition. The project team, uh, the owner, uh, next slide's good. The project team, uh, the owner is uh, Sharp Healthcare. Uh, we were the uh, structural engineers of record. I was the uh, structural engineer of record on the project, and uh, do want to recognize Chad Kloss, who had a key role as a system project manager throughout the entire project. Smith Group and ABRP were the architects. Uh, Smith Group opened their San Diego office uh, due to this project because this was a, a multiple multi-year project. And then Hensel Phelps was the design build contractor. Uh, we did have a few other key uh, players involved. Herrick was the steel sub and was uh, involved uh, from the very beginning. Side plate was the uh, lateral system that was used and involved very early as well. And uh, EXP was the uh, MEP engineer on the project. The uh, project, a few highlights, it, it was $190 million construction cost, which it, it held from the very beginning. This was a design build, uh, Oshkosh Hospital. Uh, not a lot of them had been done before this. I think there was two completed before this uh, project. And uh, so the total, and the total project was $244 million, uh, about 200,000 square feet. And uh, it went through a design build competition where we had to essentially hold that $190 million construction cost uh, when we were competing in 2015 and, and until the very end. And so uh, that was a unique uh, part of the project, but I think being designed, built, and having the collaboration with, uh, at least from our end, the steel sub and, and other uh, in the contract early on was really key to this moving very quickly and staying on budget. Uh, the primary building was the seven story tower that uh, uh, abutted up next to the existing hospital that had to stay operational through the entire process. We built a two-story entry building around the front of it to uh, completely kind of hide the existing hospital a little bit. Uh, and then there was a bunch of other make-ready projects in, in this. Uh, something that was unique to this that I thought was uh, special for this project was this is really the first new hospital built in South uh, San Diego County and uh, really since the 70s. And so I think it was uh, very much needed for the community and the timing could not have been better because uh, South San Diego has been hit pretty hard with uh, COVID and this hospital has been at capacity uh, since March and, and we really cut the ribbon right at the end of the last year. So the timing really for that community worked out very well. Uh, one thing that I think our design team uh, did that, that was unique and probably helped us win the design competition. Um, I don't know if others have spent time in hospitals. A lot of time the cafeterias are buried in the basement and they're somewhat of a depressing place in a hospital. And, uh, our team decided to put that at the very top of the building. Uh, the building is located on, really on, on one of the highest points in Chula Vista. And you can see uh, Mexico to Point Loma um, out to the ocean, hence the name of the Ocean View Tower, and around the side of it uh, to the mountains in East County. So really a pretty view and putting the rooftop dining at the top was, was key to our team. And we really thought you know, for patients, staff, and visitors, it, it really does help provide a healing environment. Project was completed on time and on budget. Next slide. Uh, this is, chart might be a little hard to see, but this is something that we were we track internally of how uh, labor hours over time on large hospitals go. And uh, most of our California hospitals have a double hump in the labor hours. So you have a design hump in the beginning and then uh, contractors come on and change things or things get learned about or things have to get redesigned. You usually see a, a, a second hump 
of labor uh, effort in, uh, in construction administration. I think this project uh, moved very, very quickly uh, from award to OSHPOD permit was uh, 18 months for, for the structure. Um, so that was designing and submitting and going through uh, the collaborative uh, review process with OSHPOD. So we had nine increments, multiple segments in each increment, but they were able to lock down uh, key structural items early on so that as we were doing our design, uh, the subcontractors could start moving forward with ordering you know, large steel sections and stuff like that. The, uh, the project uh, total from, from the day that we got awarded the project to when all the structural scope was completed was about uh, 30 months. So that may not sound fast for most projects, but that's extremely fast for a California uh, hospital uh, under OSHPA jurisdiction. And the total project was uh, uh, just under four years from award to um, getting all the sign-offs from uh, OSHPA and getting a certificate of occupancy. Next slide. Uh, quickly, there was a number of make ready permits in here, but I don't need to go through all those for, for time. Next slide. Uh, one thing that was unique about the site is that half the site was on rock, uh, very good formational soil, and uh, a, a corner of the site where our footprint was was on very soft, undocumented fill. And so we looked at many different options here. And, you know, I think initially our contractor was thinking, OK, we're probably going to do drilled piers just to kind of get even uh, bearing across the site, you know, deeper piers over on the fill and shallow piers on the other side. And uh, we came up with a solution um, working with our geotechnical consultant, Layton, and uh, we did work with Hayward Baker uh, as well to uh, see what options were out there. And we used wet soil mixing um, in the corner, which is really just pumping in kind of a slurry in, in these six foot diameters and, and filling in that corner with that undocumented fill. And they were able to do this fairly uh, cost effectively and very quickly. And they were able to do this uh, based on an early increment project so they could get in and do this while we're, we were doing the rest of our work so that when we were ready to do foundation work, we were able to start as soon as we got permit. And uh, what you can see on the slide there is those, uh, you can see the gradient, how quickly the, the rock formation drops off down the hill. And we used, used a map foundation to sit across the entire site on, with a fairly uniform bearing. Uh, this is the map foundation getting poured. We poured it in two different pours. Um, the first pour was uh, a little over 500 uh, concrete trucks in a row. Um, I, I was there for most of that pour. It started at midnight and finished at uh, about 10 or 11 the next day. Um, you know, just because it was such thick concrete, we were worried about mass concrete. So we were uh, had some unique mixes that we used in there. Very high fly ash replacement to keep the concrete. Um, uh, cooler as it was curing and then you know the nighttime just to really make sure it, um, we can control the temperatures overall it was uh, one of the largest concrete pours in, in south in south bay and and then the second pour was a little bit smaller i think it was more like 300 trucks but also an orchestra of uh concrete trucks and pumps uh, all over the site to be able to get this completed successfully next slide uh, a couple of pictures of it we had a podium structure just so that we could uh, tuck over to the existing hospital and then also keep our patient rooms uh, away from the existing hospital so they had better views and um, can see things. So the, the, the tower portion that you show is four stories uh, for the most part of patient rooms. And then there's that uh, rooftop dining on the on the west end that you can see that, that pops up and provides the seventh floor. And then there's uh, two floors below this larger podium that provided. Uh, surgery floor, ICU, and, and all the support services on the lower floors. The map foundation, which you can see in that section, we stepped it along the site just because at the one end of the site, we were dealing with really hard rock. And so we didn't want to put the uh, mat too far down. So we stepped it up and down uh, so that the retaining walls on one side of the site were a little shorter. And then we provided this five foot area throughout the core of the building where elevator pits and all MEP could be run without having to worry about uh, dealing with the map foundation penetration. So everything from the site ran in that middle core that basically had a five foot freeway where you can run things under the um, under the slab without worrying about the map foundation. Next slide. Uh, the entry building was uh, tucked up against the existing uh, hospital to provide a new drop off and uh, somewhat of an ar architectural signature. 
we had a large canopy that they wanted to see kind of floating off of this very small building behind it. So the canopy itself is as wide as is really the building that's being supported off of. So there was a skinny little concrete shear wall building that um, provided the, the entry walkway and then the canopy for the drop off. Next slide. And then our, this is our last slide, just some of the uh, looks inside. Uh, Smith Group and ABRP did a really great job, in my opinion, of, of just creating a very cost-effective hospital, but the finishes look like you're in you know, high-end hotel when you're in there, and, and they really did a good job of being able to provide the high you know, high health healthcare um, uh, healing environments for patients and staff, and, and it really turned out very well. And you can see that you're looking out towards the East County where the mountains are on the one side, and and, and really on the other side, you get nice open uh, ocean views on a clear day. So that is it for us. Like, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, Mike, uh, nobody has posted any questions in the chat yet, but I do have one quick question. You mentioned uh, that it was a, uh, a pretty massive pour for the mat. How thick was the was the mat foundation? Uh, we we varied it to try to be efficient you know, as part of the design build uh, effort. So it, it was five feet uh, typically, and then we stepped it up to uh, three feet, but uh, at the transition zones, it got up to eight feet thick uh, where you're stepping in some of these areas. So those were the really those thicker areas that we were mostly worried about. The three foot section we weren't too worried about. Thank you. Sure. Well, Leif, uh, well, Mike, thank you for uh, presenting. Uh, Leith, we want to move on to the, the second one since there, nobody's posted any other questions. Okay, so we're going to move to to Kaufman's entry. Um, Chad, uh, if you can please unmute yourself and then I'll go ahead and start the, uh, the presentation for you. Great. Yeah, thanks, Leith. Uh, my name is Chad McDonald, uh, project manager um, at Kaufman. Um, honor to accept this award on behalf of Kaufman. I also want to give a shout out to Kiki Witsit, who was the PM uh, project manager on this project, and also uh, Naeem uh, Namadi, who's with the city of San Diego now, but I'm not sure, you know, he's an active CIOS member, so he might be on this call, but uh, Naeem did a lot of the ASD 41 um, studies and a lot of the, the heavy lifting on that, so I want to give a shout out to him. Um, Late, there were there were a couple of slides previous. I'm not sure if those got cut out. If not, you know that's fine. But uh, either way, there, you know, there's a couple. You know, what we're looking at here, we got an existing uh, view on the left, uh, a new a new, you know, after construction on the right. So the project itself is located in Mission Valley, um, in San Diego, kind of right where the I-8 and I-63 meet, and it's just south of the San Diego River. Uh, a couple of interesting facts about this project itself is um, it used to be home of the San Diego Union Tribune newspaper for 40 years. And one of the things that the new ownership Casey Brown company did is when they bought this uh, campus, they named it Ampersand because that was the last character that was pr uh, printed um, in this building um, when they were still printing newspapers. So um, kind of some interesting tidbits um, just to, announced kind of the project team. Wolcott Architecture was architect. Um, Casey Brown Company was the owner. Uh, CW Driver was a contractor. And then, you know, Kaufman and us being the structural engineer. So uh, a couple of things to highlight on the retrofits. It's obviously a pretty complex project. And, and just for effort of time, we'll maintain just looking at a couple of the, the bigger picture retro retrofits. Uh, the existing building itself was three stories um, designed for industrial print building. Uh, it's concrete. Uh, first two levels are elevated, mild reinforced concrete slabs. The roof is bare metal deck with traditional steel framing. Um, the lateral system in it was comprised of a combination of 10 inch concrete shear walls and 10 and a half inch, uh, luckily reinforced two white uh, brick. The the first the first uh, major renovation we did it was there's a high bay warehouse that kind of went right through the middle of this building and, and we transitioned that and uh, demoed the entry wall along with that high bay warehouse to kind of create this outdoor courtyard with mural space and there's a uh, outdoor garden 
and then kind of on the back end of that, a little bit hard to see, but in the right picture, there's a couple levels of office expansion, which is, you know, structural steel effort there with some outdoor balconies for collaborative space. Um, the other big uh, renovation was we added a new 64 foot enclosed bridge to connect between the two wings. And then we've had uh, large format windows throughout uh, the building on the perimeter to, to you know, engage more natural light into the space. So next slide. So one of the first challenges to kind of describe here is, you know, looking at a couple of pictures here of the exterior elevations. So the picture on the left is, is obviously the existing conditions while the picture on the right was after we, you know, put in some of these large format windows. The, the picture on the left kind of can be, you know, a little confusing. It looks like there's brick wall throughout, but actually level one is a concrete shear wall with the brick facade, whereas levels two and three are the reinforced two white brick walls. You can kind of see there's a concrete band up at the roof level and then each of the four levels, that's a spandrel beam that runs between columns to column. Um, the original design actually, because the walls were so long, um, they only designed for uh, in-plane shear and didn't look at like overturning or in-plane flexural. So one of the big complications is once we introduce all of these new large format windows, we now created a bunch of smaller piers that may or, you know, most likely were not designed for those overturning forces. And, and you know, we now have a, kind of a, a different type of design that we had to look at. So which kind of leads into the next slide. So kind of a lot going on here if you're seeing this picture for the first time. So kind of give everyone a little background. The black and white is kind of just a, a blow up of um, one of our building elevations that was on our structural drawing. The blue is just some more context so you can kind of understand uh, what was going on since you're not seeing the whole picture with all the design drawings. And the red was just kind of giving an example of how now this one long wall has turned into shorter wall piers and we've kind of introduced some new overturning forces, um, which the original walls weren't designed. Um, that being said, most of the, the walls at the first level, the 10 inch concrete walls were fine as is and didn't need um, a lot of retrofit, but the level two um, white, brick white uh, walls needed pretty extensive FRP. Uh, one thing also to add a, a little more complication of the project is the you know owner wanted to keep the exterior brick facade as is so all the FRP applications were limited to the interior face um, so kind of looking at this graphic here kind of at the middle level two that hatches all new FRP on the interior face of the brick there were a few places where uh, the 10 inch concrete wall needed some additional capacity so we added some shot creek to the inside to give us that capacity and then even because now we have these shorter piers, we have new overturning forces. So we we had to add new micro piles under some foundations where there may have not been adequate foundation support, as well as some FRP that basically ran the length of the column and then continued through the slabs um, to give some additional tensile capacity into those columns with those new overturning loads. Um, next slide. So the, Another big challenge was the pedestrian bridge. So the picture, first picture on the left, uh, in construction view of the bridge spanning between wing to wing. Um, the middle picture is if you're sort of on the bridge in the midst of construction. And the picture on the right is, is giving you an idea of, of what the final look uh, came to and almost at the end of construction. So the bridge itself was 64 feet long. We had no um, interior or intermediate columns. Um, we did have to add columns on both ends with new foundations with micro piles. In order to span the entire 64 feet, we used the deep worn truss design on both ends, which you can kind of see in the picture. One of the tricky aspects with this bridge was on the right side of the bridge, if you're looking at the picture, there's actually a seismic joint that runs the full length of the building. And because of that, we couldn't, you know, attach the building seismically to both, to both wings, which means it was only connected seismically on the left hot left side and we had a cantilever out in the diaphragms this length and we did that with you know a combination of bracing in the, in the diaphragms but also these tension compression struts that run the length of the bridge and then tying those back into the existing diaphragm with a series of of steel beams tucked to the underside of the 
existing slabs and then through bolted in to transfer that shear. Next slide. So with all, you know, we've all done a bunch of tenant improvements or, or renovations and, and coming with that, you always need to get pretty unique and creative with your um, detailing and, and retrofit scheme. So here's just one example of, of one of the details we had in our drawings. It, it, it's basically just kind of showing how we tied in one end of the bridge back to the building. So kind of in the middle of that detail, you can see that grid 4.3, or you know maybe you can't, depending how big it is on your screen. But there's a that's the end of the column there for the the bridge, and you can kind of see the last diagonal and the strut beam tying into that column. In order to transfer those forces back to that slab, we had a, in this case a W10 by 49 link beam, <clears throat> which was you know had some welded connections to both the bridge and then some of the beams I talked to you before. There's a series of them that tie back into the underside of the level three diaphragm and then they're through bolted you know for an extended length of time you're only seeing a, a very small glimpse of it here but just to you know eventually transfer all that shear load back into the diaphragm in a reasonable length next slide um so you know kind of gloss over it early on so you know we had this high bay warehouse and they wanted to demo that out and, and put some you know, new space, courtyard space in there and really open up the building to kind of give windows on those three sides and let in a lot more natural light. So the picture on the left is just demo of of them, you know, in, in the midst of construction, taking down that high bay warehouse. You can still see there are still a couple of the plate girders up um, that, that the, they took down. The picture on the right is actually a, a final picture. Um, you could see the bridge at the front of the courtyard. You could see some of that open airspace collaborative space with gardens. And then in the back, kind of hard to see in this picture is where there are some of those couple level office expansions with some balconies for collaborative space. Uh, last slide. So, you know, kind of one thing that was even kind of touched on in um, some of the, the committees I was hearing is, you know, one thing that was really nice about this project is we got to keep some of the history with the San Diego Union Tribune and really, you know, making the San Diego Riverfront, um, you know, a little more updated and, and revitalized. And, and a big thing that kind of goes into that with both CIOS views and Kaufman's views is sustainability and being able to take an existing building, salvaging it and turning it into an interesting and unique office space, uh, you know, really reduces the carbon footprint on our built environment. And so that, that's another just achievement that we're proud of at, at Kaufman for this project. Um, and with that, it sort of wraps up my presentation here on this project. Um, <laughs> currently, there's uh, there's no questions on here. Uh, I'll ask one, a quick one just so you at least get uh, some sort of question. Uh, you mentioned that at least one end of the of the uh, um, pedestrian bridge was seismically isolated uh, from the building. Uh, did you guys run any studies or consider possibly was the configuration of the building such enough that you could have potentially uh, hard tied it in at both sides if you can get basically both wings to work together? Yeah, Steve, Steve good question. We didn't, I mean, we looked a little bit, but for the most part, because the existing building already had a seismic joint running through there, we, we kind of spent our efforts to see if we could get it to work out um, and, and pencil out just with the cantilevered options. And you know, although some long nights and some hair pulling, we did come to a solution. So we we just went forward with that with that option. Oh, that ma that makes sense. I didn't I didn't under I didn't realize that there was already an existing size joint there. Thank you. Oh, here somebody came in with a question. Um, how is the subterranean level built into the model? I noticed the column layout in the original ISA view. Uh, that was from Matt Mangano. Is that was that for this pro um, question or was that for the previous one? Uh, Matt. Yeah. Um, so there. Yeah. So I think what you were kind of seeing in some of the renderings is it's it's not really sub training. It's more of deep deep foundation system. So micro piles and um, that. So it, it may have been giving an illusion. I think it was like on one of the first slides, maybe that uh, it looked like maybe there was some sub training level, but. Realistically, I think that's just, you know, these are excerpts from Revit. So I think what you're just seeing is, 
you know, we modeled in those <clears throat> pile foundations and pile caps. And I think that's kind of what you're seeing there. All right, thank you very much, Chad. We'll move on to our last uh, speaker today. Let's go ahead and introduce him with. So we're we'll we'll end up for the the winners this uh, of this year with Eric from KPFF. Um, Eric, if you can please unmute yourself, and I'll, I'll go ahead and start the the presentation for you. Sure. Can you hear me? We can. All right. Well, this this is probably the smallest uh, project to win an award in Seahawk history. So this is the chapel at um, New Chapel at Point Loma Nazarene University. And I uh, wanted to just uh, recognize Kerry Johnson for their architecture and bike core as the contractor. Next slide. Um, it's. Of a sculpture than a building in a lot of ways. Um, the entrance, as you saw on the previous slide, if you want to skip back one, uh, is a uh, weathering steels. Uh, tunnel essentially and uh, you can go forward again the um, walls are all cast in place concrete there's a cast in place concrete floor that cantilevers out over the the foundation and the, there's some structural steel in the roof next slide so this is a little plan showing the uh, roof and you can see the solid lines of the concrete walls the the foundation only extends the width of that narrow portion, so everything else is cantilevered out. Uh, they're fairly heavy uh, walls, nine inch thick. And one of the challenges is that the diaphragm, which you see shaded there, doesn't connect to the walls. So obviously that was a little bit of a challenge for the lateral system. So uh, we just uh, welded some plates to the wall and connected to some steel beams and created an ordinary moment frame out of the concrete walls and the steel beams, which is uh, just one interesting aspect of this. Next one. So you can see on the right uh, how the frame is formed by the concrete walls and the uh, connection of the steel beams to the wall. Um, what I neglected to mention on the previous slide is that there's a skylight all around the perimeter of the roof so uh, the architect wanted very little interruption in that and that's why the beams could not continue all the way through and connect to the wall um, there's also a lot of hanging wood uh, uh, a ceiling in there there's uh, a cross structure a lot of interior work go to the next one and i just picked out this detail of the, where that beam uh connects to the wall via a, a heavy steel plate and a, and a big embed in the wall and this just created enough uh, of a moment connection to resist lateral loads on this small building and it was um you know everything mattered in this everything was exposed so uh, you can see that the embed plate is recessed so it disappears which is a little bit of challenge for making sure we had access for the welder and uh, also that the heat of the well didn't spall the concrete. Uh, so that all worked out and you can see the form liner there, just really detailed uh, concrete work. Everything again is exposed. Next one. And there's just a few details. You can see uh, what uh, some of the interior and, and exterior details look like. And then next one, last one. Um, it's cool structure. Hopefully you can see it at nighttime. It, it, it looks like it's kind of floating there. Um, and uh, we enjoyed the opportunity to be involved. Thanks for the award. Thank you. Well, there's currently not any questions in the chat. Um, Quick question for you, Eric. Um, was the cantilevered look of the building, was that dictated purely by the architect or were there some uh, other uh, site or foundation issues that kind of warranted 
uh, cantilevering portions of the structure off that center portion? It was pretty much a, a, an architectural uh, element. Um, yeah, and, and you can see they wrap that base in stone. So it's got kind of a cool stone base and then this whole thing kind of looks like it's floating over the top of it. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, um, welcome. Olaf, if you'd like to conclude the awards portion. Oh. Uh, well, okay. Uh, well, thank you guys again for for attending the the award ceremony, and thanks to all the judges and the participating firms for putting on the time and the effort uh, for all of us. Um, the as as was mentioned before, the this year we received uh, a lot of uh, a lot of awards that really showed what our what our community is capable of, and uh, we would like to see more of this in the future. So please consider. Uh, participating in the next years and uh, we're we're continuously working on making the awards uh improving the awards and making it worth your time and uh introducing to the world what structural engin uh, engineers do beyond uh what the building looks like um just a final reminder that if you guys still want to take another look at any of those entries uh, all of those have been uh, uploaded or all the posters are already uploaded on our um, LinkedIn page, as Jackie has mentioned. So you can go through the LinkedIn page, look at the poster one more time if you'd like, if you have any, uh, if you have uh, one, take another look at any of those. If you still have any more questions, feel free to to email me. Um, I'll be happy to forward your questions to, to, the, uh, to the firm's uh, and get you guys connected. Um, thank you again, and hopefully we see much more turnout in the future. And if, uh, let me know if you guys need anything from us. Thank you, Leif. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'd like to just second uh, um, what uh, Leif uh, was saying. I would like to encourage every um, every firm to, uh, to participate in the the awards um program um we want to encourage encourage a, a diverse group of uh um uh group of firms from the you know small little one person shops to the the large firms that uh um uh that are uh um practicing in our community so thank you uh um <clears throat> thank you to all that participated this year and um with that, I'd like to conclude our uh, um, our award ceremony. Uh, thank you all for hanging in with us. I know it went a bit longer than uh, was originally promised, but uh, everybody got to share what they're doing this year, and we got to recognize some very good projects. Um, uh, thank you to uh, Leith for putting together this award ceremony. Um, he did a, he did a great job, and I can't wait to see uh, what he's able to do uh, next year when we're able to hopefully do this in person. Uh, just a couple uh, reminders. Um, we have our August 20th um, webinar with the community, um, the continuing education committee regarding the uh, um, the DSDs uh, moving to a uh, online uh, uh, submittal and permitting process. And then on September 15th, we have our uh, um, seminar with uh, uh, Mike Romanowski uh, from Woodworks uh, regarding uh, the new tall wood provisions. Uh, so with that, I'd uh, um, conclude the meeting and we will see you in September. Thank you.